It's the 27th of September 2013 and you're listening to The Pod Delusion, a podcast about interesting things. I'm James O'Malley. Coming up this week, we answer the questions. When campaigning on Twitter against Tesco, does every little help? Did anyone throw a punch at Soho Skeptic's gender debate? Are we really going to attempt to explain multidimensional mathematics on the radio? What's it like being a secret liberal in the Fox News bunker? Can new research help us understand motor neurons disease? And will the Tokyo Olympics be good for human rights? Now you may remember a few shows ago we had a couple of pieces by Mark Neymark about the Olympics and their attitude to human rights. Since then Tokyo has won the 2020 Olympics so we thought it wise to ask Mark, what does he make of that? When I spoke on the pod delusion a few weeks ago, the members of the International Olympic Committee were about to choose the host of the 2020 Olympics and to elect their new president. As you know, the suspense is over and the results are Tokyo and Thomas Bach. What does this mean for those who want the IOC to do more than pay lip service to the notion of human rights and to become a force for progress in the world, in particular for women and LGBT people? With regard to Tokyo, it's not a bad choice. From the perspective of the Federation of Gay Games, of which I'm a board member, it's a promising situation. While it's hard to imagine a dynamic LGBT sports community in Turkey, and while Spain already has a lively and growing network of LGBT sports clubs, Japan is a bit of a mystery. LGBT organizations are not very visible, and LGBT sport even less so. I was contacted recently by a university professor in Japan who's keen to visit the gay games to learn more about LGBT sport because he's not aware of clubs in his own country. A couple of years ago, the FGG passed on a message from the U.S. State Department, which was seeking LGBT sports groups in Japan and had failed to find any, and we heard nothing back. And yet, given its size and wealth, Japan should be able to offer a wide choice in LGBT sport. We'd of course love to see a Pride House at the Tokyo Olympics and hope that we'll be able to help promote the movement in Japan, where they could in turn offer great support for the fast-growing LGBT sports network in Southeast Asia and even in China. With regard to Thomas Bach, the new IOC president, we're not quite as excited or hopeful. He's a longtime member of the IOC, as were his rivals. The IOC is a private club, even a gentleman's club, and you don't get in if you don't fit the part. And you certainly don't get elected to the presidency by rocking the boat. Given that his main campaign argument has been to loosen the strict bidding process for the Olympics, which was tightened in part to fight against corruption after the scandal of the Salt Lake City Olympic bid, it's hard to see this as progress, and particularly hard to see greater concern for human rights incorporated into bidding. Bach also has close ties with the Gulf states, in particular Kuwait, and he's been accused of using his position in the IOC to further his business interests there. He's a lawyer. Will Mr. Bach be protesting many Arab states' oppression of women and gays? Will he be calling on them to offer women full access to sport? Will he be insisting on an end to homophobic laws that affect sports people? Given that the first call he took as president was from his friend and supporter, Vladimir Putin, it's hard to see that happening. And yet, Bach is a good businessman. He inherits from Jacques Rogge an IOC in a strong financial position, and he knows that money talks. And the more accommodating the IOC shows itself to be of Russian homophobia, the greater the risk that the money will be talking louder, perhaps even shrieking a bit. During the IOC meeting in Buenos Aires, Gerhard Heiberg, chairman of the IOC's marketing commission, expressed his fears about the impact of the protests against the laws for IOC sponsors, who are very present in Western Europe and North America, places where locking people up for saying they're gay is not seen as good public policy. And we are are seeing calls for boycotts of some of these sponsors, including Coca-Cola and McDonald's, in early October. Heisberg said, I'm being pushed by several of the sponsors, asking what will happen with this new law in Russia in connection with the gay community. We are not trying to change anything over the laws in Russia. We will of course accept this as an internal Russian decision, but what will the consequences be? I heard a lot from the sponsors, especially the American sponsors, what they are afraid of could happen. I think this could ruin a lot for all of us. 
the solution is easy to see. The IOC should not have chosen repressive Russia in the first place. When homophobic laws began to be discussed, the IOC should have used the threat of moving the games or excluding the Russian team as a lever to put a stop to them. They could at the least have promised those contesting these laws a safe haven in the Olympic Village. The IOC has chosen to take none of these steps and may pay the price for their complacence. It is now more important than ever for those concerned about fair and free competition for athletes, for those who believe in the power of sport to bring progress to the world, to work together. As the Sochi Olympics draw closer, we hope that opponents of these laws and proponents of an Olympic movement that truly respects the principles of its own charter will work together on joint actions to let the IOC hear that by taking action now, it can avoid ruin in Sochi. As a start, perhaps Mr. Heisberg and Mr. Bach can post a photograph of themselves holding hands on our photo blog to support visible solidarity with those attending the Sochi Games. You can do the same at our photo blog, Hold hands in Sochi.tumblr.com. This is Mark Namark of the Federation of Gay Games, commenting for the Pod Delusion.